is a pleasure for me to introduce to you Professor Katie Day from the Lutheran College of Philadelphia in the United States, where she holds a professorship for church and society. She received her PhD from the Temple University on urban religion, urban sociology, and is ordained in the Presbyterian Church. Her research on urban religion is of high relevance. She has conducted major studies of faith-based community organizing, religious responses to HIV, AIDS in South Africa, and religious social agencies. She is involved as an activist in several urban issues, including gun violence. And we all know what a burning issue this is. In her paper, she will explore the relation of public theology and public education in the city. And I think this will be a very specific and central contribution to our overall theme. And what I have read in the, her abstract, I know that it is a very, very uh, yeah, conflict near area. She is dealing with the questions of a divided society and what it means for religious communities to deal with it. Hearty welcome to you. Good afternoon. Where I come from, this is the dreaded time slot right after lunch. So I have to, with my afternoon classes, move a lot and keep people awake. So if you feel yourself slipping into a coma, let me know. <laughs> Public education in the, U in the US has been part of the rel our relatively new nation since its inception. The construction of public education has been grounded in some of the lofty commitments upon which our country was founded, particularly egalitarianism. And universally accessible education has been considered critical to our democracy. Yet today, public education is itself in crisis and stands in contradiction to the values on which it was constructed. In this paper, I will first give you a brief overview of the history of public education in the US, then describe the realities and dynamics of urban schools, and finally go on to map out the challenges for public theologians and possible strategies for our participation in the public forum. First, the origins of public education in the United States. Those coming to what was called the New World, what became North America from Europe, brought with them a high appreciation for the value of education. Puritan settlers in New England particularly valued education as a means to read and interpret the Bible, as well as being essential to contribute to the common good. By 1635 in Boston, the first public school was established for boys. It, it continues to operate today. Just seven years later, schooling became compulsory in Massachusetts, and soon thereafter, the first school paid by local taxes was established in one of its communities. The school was headed by a clergyman. These early days of establishing schools, in other words, were often the result of religious motivation and advocacy. Funding came both from public and private treasuries out of an increasing recognition that for this country to thrive economically and politically, an educated citizenry was essential. President John Adams wrote in 1785, the whole people must take upon themselves the education of the whole people and be willing to bear the expenses of it. There should not be a district of one square mile without a school in it, not founded by a charitable individual, but maintained at the public expense of the people themselves. 
By the turn of the 18th century, two-thirds of white children were being educated. By the mid-19th century, there was a movement to expand education to all children advocated by what was called the Common School Movement. This movement promoted public funding with communities funding their own schools. Philosopher and educational theorist John Dewey promoted the idea that education was essential for a democratic society and advocated a common curriculum even as schools were locally funded. Consequently, states began passing compulsory education laws and by 1870, all states provided free primary education for both boys and girls. Although the moral impulse for public education was rooted in an Enlightenment and Protestant ideal of egalitarianism, there were from the beginning inequities along the lines of gender, race, and class. Accessibility to education for girls lagged behind that of boys. Cultural elites developed their own private schools, many of which also continue to educate the children of the wealthy. Native peoples were not included. And slaveholding states prohibited the education and teaching of reading to the slaves by law. These, what has been called savage inequalities, were significantly challenged during the progressive era of the late 19th, early 20th century, which was ushered in after industrialization and the growth of modern cities. Progressivism was fed from a, diverse, a number of diverse streams, including the elevation of science, religious revivalism, which was itself inherently egalitarian, abolitionism, and the social gospel movement, which focused on elevating the urban poor. During this progressive era, faith-based efforts animated the flourishing of many civic reforms focusing on protecting children, including child labor laws, compulsory education, women's suffrage, and prohibition of alcohol. Didn't last very long. <laughs> The period of Reconstruction after the Civil War in the mid-19th century saw the extension of education to the freed slaves in the South. Many classrooms of formerly enslaved children in the South were taught by former abolitionists from the North coming down from Quaker and other religious traditions. During the Progressive Era, education was expanded greatly, especially in the growing urban centers. Secondary education, that is high school, became compulsory to include older children and teens. By 1920, one third of eligible students were enrolled in secondary education, and by 1940, half received high school diplomas. So as the American public education system developed, there were distinctive markers that set it apart from education in other contexts. First, the commitment to universal access. Second, having a common or core curriculum. Third, public funding, which gave communities control uh, over their schools to a large extent. And fourth, uh, distinctive, especially for people at this conference, is the high wall of separation between church and state as expressed in the First Amendment that Congress shall make no law establishing religion or inhibiting the free exercise of religion. And what that means for public schools is that religion cannot be taught in the public school, but it can be taught about in some ways. So the First Amendment plays into public education very heavily. The intent was from all of these that equal access to a common education would have a leveling effect on American society, ensuring a democratic society. However, there were some difficulties. First of all, local funding and con control could conflict with the common core curriculum promoted at the federal level. These conflicts continue to the present as many communities battle over 
teaching how to teach evolution or creationism, comparative religions, and sexuality, for example. The second contradiction was that of race. Historians have shown how more homogeneous communities were more comfortable with the universal access to publicly funded education. However, in communities where there was racial diversity, schools became segregated, and African-American schools in particular were underfunded and under-resourced. In the famous case of 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court decided that this was not a violation of the rights of African Americans and that segregated schools could be separate yet equal. This principle prevailed until it was finally struck down in 1954 in the decision Brown versus the Board of Education in which it was clearly demonstrated that segregated schools were inferior, leaving black children at a clear educational disadvantage in entering the workforce. As a result of Brown, integration was now mandated in all schools, a ruling that many communities chafed at or just ignored, feeling as if the federal government was violating the principle of community control of schools. Meanwhile, African Americans were falling further behind economically, and it became clear to the Lyndon Johnson administration in the 60s that education was directly related to life chances, that is, whether one would be uh, economically successful or poor. So as part of his package of anti-poverty po policies known as the War on Poverty, Congress passed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965, which directly pipelined federal funding into disadvantaged schools. It also uh, established early childhood education programs known as Head Start, as data showed that children from impoverished backgrounds were not on a level playing field in entering primary school and predicting their academic success. Although some communities balked at the increased federal involvement and oversight, it looked as if American public education was returning to its commitments of universal access and equal opportunity. But a number of factors served to derail this trajectory, resulting <laughs> in significant inequalities. Since the 1960s, federal education policies have been politically fraught Republican administrations have argued that responsibility for academic achievement rests with individuals or with particular schools showing poor performance. There have been several attempts, meanwhile, in Republican administrations to dismantle the Federal Department of Education altogether and to punitively defund underperforming schools, often in the poorest neighborhoods. Democrats have attempted to recover the original impulses of universal access, public funding, and a common curriculum, particularly Obama, in order to ensure equal opportunity to a good education. Republican and Democratic approaches have differed on several political perspectives. Whether the federal go government should have jurisdiction over local control, whether increased funding in in fact produces better outcomes, and whether education is a fundamental right to which all citizens are entitled. Moving on to a snapshot of the current situation of disparity. Currently, public education in the U.S. is far from being equitable, but resembles the old separate but equal world which prompted the desegregation ruling in 1954. White students account for half of all public school students, Latinos comprise one quarter, and African Americans 15% of the student population. Despite the fact that they represent 40% of those in the public education system, students of color are at a distinct disadvantage by almost every indicator, resulting in what is known as the achievement gap. For example, consider the disparity of reading and math scores 
between white and African-American children. So you can see that, oops. So the, these are tests taken in the fourth grade, the eighth grade, and the twelfth grade. And in reading um, and math, and in every instance, the white uh, students outscore the African-American students. Further, for African-American high school students, college entrance exam scores are 25 percent lower than that of their white counterparts. This results in different outcomes with 40, oops, I keep doing that, with 43 percent of the white uh, whites completing a degree after high school, but just 28 percent of African Americans doing so. The economic returns on post-secondary education are dramatic. An associate's or bachelor's degree is essential for almost all better paying jobs. Within their school experiences, disparities continue to exist for students of color. For example, according to data from the U.S. Department of Education Civil Rights Division, black students are suspended from school almost four times more than white students. In schools with higher minority enrollments, there are far fewer advanced courses offered in math and science, further contributing to a racial disparity in getting in college. Research also shows that in these majority minority schools, that is most students are minority, the teachers hired are less experienced and lower paid and less likely to be certified. Putting this together with stu studies showing racial bias in teachers' expectations of students, it's no wonder that students of color become discouraged and have much higher rates of absenteeism and dropping out of school altogether. Without a high school diploma and the possibility for further education, employment opportunities are limited. The informal economy, particularly arms and drug trafficking, is more lucrative than a minimum wage job. Despite the rational choice that participation in the underground economy represents, the risk for street, doing street crime is high, resulting in the likelihood of arrest. The movement of so many African-American men who have dropped out of school and ended up in the penal system is known as the school to prison pipeline. You can see um, how disproportionately African-Americans and students of color are in going into uh, the um, uh, incarceration. Currently, that currently, there are more African-American men in the prison system, that is, incarcerated or on parole, than were enslaved in 1850 at the dawn of the Civil War. The challenges, then, faced by these prisoners reentering society are formidable and make the process, prospects of personal success very slim. Recidivism is very high. The result then is that families are disrupted, further stacking the deck for the next generation. Single pa parent households become the norm, and adults struggling to make ends meet, often working multiple jobs, are not in a position to provide the kind of enrichment enrichment activities to their children that would contribute to their academic success. So you can see the difference in uh, white and black uh, children having uh, parents be able to read them a story or get involved in arts and crafts or visiting a library. It is clear from these consequences that public education is not serving our minority students well. Originally, the universal access to education was intended to contribute to a robust economy by supplying an educated workforce. It would equip its citizens to be self-supporting while contributing to the common good. At its core, education w was intended as an anti-poverty program. However, 
Rather than leveling the playing field, American public education, for the most part, is reproducing rather than reducing poverty. Educational attainment has a dramatic of impact on employment prospect, prospects and income in the U.S. Those who do not finish high school can only expect to earn two-thirds of the average income level of a high school graduate. Those who complete college will earn over twice what a high school dropout would make. We can go back to this if this is too confusing. People of color in the U.S. are disproportionately located in urban centers due to a number of social and political factors. While poverty is no, by no means limited to cities, it too is disproportionately represented in urban context. Due to racialized residential patterns, again the result of social forces, economic trends, and political public policies, most cities appear as a patchwork of neighborhoods differentiated by socioeconomic status and race with an overlapping consolidation of poverty in minority neighborhoods. Therefore, to talk about the inferior education provided to most people of color and its relationship to poverty is to focus on urban education. Let me give an example of my own city. Uh, of Philadelphia, which has a population of 1.5 million and is the fifth largest city in the country. However, among the 10 largest cities in the country, it has the highest poverty rate of 27 percent, with almost four in 10 children living in poverty. After more affluent parents take put their kids in parochial and private schools, that leaves a public school population with 70% of the children being impoverished. Philadelphia's unemployment rate of 7% is, remains stubbornly above the national and state levels, while its job creation rate also lags behind. It's no surprise, then, that it also has the highest homicide rate among the 10 largest cities. Last year, there were 280 homicides, um, 226 of which were by gun. The Philadelphia School District, the largest in the state of Pennsylvania, is constantly struggling to cover its budget. Announced cuts in program have become an annual ritual. Teachers, nurses, counselors, librarians are among the positions eliminated while schools are closed. Schools are closed, resulting in overcrowded classrooms. Programs in art, music, physical education have become rare in city schools. Younger students are not provided any instruction in science. At issue for the cash-strapped school district is the formula for funding. Funding comes from federal, state, and local sources with the greatest chunk coming from the local community. In Pennsylvania, as in other states, school funding comes from property taxes. Cities like Philadelphia have lower property values, so less revenue is generated. In addition, they have, these cities have higher demands on their treasury to cover public services and regional institutions. Suburban communities with higher property values and less demand on their municipal budgets can afford to spend more on education. The result is that Philadelphia spends about $12,500 per pupil each year. But right over the line in the next suburban community, uh, they're able to spend $22,000 dollars per student each year, $10,000 a year more. Further, the state contribution to local education is calculated so that these more affluent districts receive even higher levels of funding from the state. But is it only about financial resources? Does increased funding actually result in better outcomes for students? There are some studies, now largely discredited, that argue that public funding is immaterial to the quality of education provided, and the two should be delinked. 
but one has only to look at the vast difference between the outcomes of students in Philadelphia and their counterparts in the better funded districts. The, their underfunded schools have consistently lower test school scores and lower graduation rates. This translates into lowered expectation for post-secondary education, that is college, and therefore earning a livable wage. The relationship between adequate funding of public schools and positive educational outcomes is intuitive, but it is also well documented by a strong body of research. Apart from understanding the statistical analyses, citizens can simply ask, how can we expect students in such underfunded schools to flourish? How can they be expected to compete educationally when their classrooms are crowded, their teachers are stressed, their curriculum is minimal, and their buildings in disrepair? As one frustrated Philadelphia public school teacher said to me, it's easier for my students to get a gun than a textbook. We have a two-tiered education system in our American cities, what writer Jonathan Kozel has described as apartheid schooling. Thirdly, how should public theology engage this issue? Public education was intended as a major contributor to the common good and a safeguard against poverty. Yet I have argued it is structured in such a way as to reproduce inequality in our society by ensuring that the haves will be provided the resources to thrive in the political economy and the have-nots, particularly poor urban communities of color, will not be adequately prepared for par participation in the global, global economy. Of course, there are many examples of efforts by students, parents, educators, lobbyists, legislators, and citizens to advocate for change in the system. But for the most part, public theology has not significantly engaged the issue of public education. This omission is curious, especially since there was support for public education from church leadership from its earliest roots in colonial America. Public theologians in the social gospel tradition advocated for reform of child labor laws and education laws to protect universal access to public education. Equal access to education was at the heart of the civil rights movement led by faith leaders from the Brown versus Board of Education decision to the integration of public schools often organized by local clergy. Yet currently the most Yet currently, most theological engagement with the issue of public education focuses on the particular issues of maintaining the separation of church and state in local battles of school curricula, such as those around creationism. The voices of theologians are seldom heard in public discourse around education reform, even though it seems like this would be a natural fit. Public theology at its very heart is concerned about the common good. A theological basis for commitment to the common good comes from several streams from Protestant and Catholic sources. Within that, there are theological perspectives informing commitments to social cohesion, human flourishing, equality, democracy, and inclusivity within civil society, all of which reflect the goals of universal public education as well. Public theologians can draw from several doctrinal wells to inform an approach to the education issue. The first is the theological anthropology of personhood. Human existence was affirmed by the incarnation of the divine in a human body in the person of Jesus Christ. Further, scripture instructs us not to look on individuals in worldly ways, that is, not according to gender, race, class, ethnicity, somatype, or we would say also sexual orientation. Each human being is a child of God with inalienable rights to life and development. Each child is therefore entitled to an education that will contribute to their becoming all God intends for them to be and enjoy, whether that child lives in a poor city, school district, or an affluent community. This shines a radical light on the structure of 
public education in the U.S. and should be a starting point for public theology. But also, the Imago Dei, the image of God, should not be considered only in individualistic terms. That is, each individual has the thumbprint of God implanted. Rather, God's image is reflected in community when humanity is woven together in a web of interdependent relationships. Let us make Adham, humanity, in our image, other words attributed to the creator in the ancient text of Genesis. To reflect God's image is to be in relationship, in community, even as God's self is in relationship and in community. Such a grounding in creation theology, which is communalistic rather than individualistic, will lead to different approaches to public theology and different policies. This theological approach to the common good and the Imago Dei argues for the development of the whole person through education to be a basic human right, not a commodity or a privilege for those who can afford quality education. This, of course, resonates with the Universal Declaration of, on Human Rights, Article 26. I won't read the whole thing. Everyone has a right to education. It should be free. It should be compulsory. Um, higher education should be equally accessible. Education as a human right and the critical component in the prevention of poverty has been echoed by the Millennium Development Goals and its successor, the Sustainable Development Goals, of which number four states, full access to quality education is the first step to achieving sustainable development, poverty eradication, gender equality, and women's empowerment. With such a depth of historic involvement, theological foundation, and affirmation from the international community, why then is public theology largely missing in full-throated advocacy for education reform? A number of theories could be suggested, including the social location of churches and the investment in parochial education at the expense, often, of public education. Perhaps another factor, factor which has stymied public theology is its inability to understand and to speak the language of education reform. Education policy is a field unto itself, defined by complex social research and data analysis, competing theoretical constructions and political interests to be considered. It is one of the publics within civil society with which public theology must become conversant. Here is another occasion for developing what Elaine Graham has called our bilinguality. Theologians need to become smarter about the issue of public education if we are to engage in that discourse with confidence and credibility. I would like to conclude by highlighting two examples of public theologians effectively engaging the issue of public urban public education. These, of course, are anecdotal, but do provide models of public advocacy which are both faithful and effective. The first, as with many examples of public theology, the first is represented by a person named David Hornbeck. Mr. Hornbeck was the head of Maryland Public Schools and then the superintendent of the Philadelphia School District from 1994 to 2000. He brought with him a 10-point plan called Children Achieving with a recipe for reforming public education in the city. All 10 points had to be in place in order to, uh, to be successful, beginning with high expectations for all students and including commitments to make sure teachers are continually receiving training, ensuring that there are community services for all children, particularly underprivileged children, providing updated technology and early childhood education to level the playing field, and of course, insisting on ample funding. Hornbeck was a bit of a policy wonk, armed with a depth of knowledge of educational theory and best practices. But according to our, news, our local newspaper, what they, the school department, got was a crusader. 
Hornbeck never stopped saying poor children and children of color were being sinfully shortchanged when it came to how the schools were funded in much of the country. His plan was working and the quality of education was demonstrably improving as reflected in reading test scores. However, his passionate faith-based advocacy led him into direct contact, conflict with the state legislature. When they refused to increase funding to the under-resourced city school district, he brought legal action against them, boldly charging the state with racial discrimination in the provision of public education. He was forced to resign. But he has continued to work as an organizer for school reform, believing that fair funding for education is what he calls the civil rights issue of the 21st century. David Hornbeck publicly locates his commitment to working for equal access to quality education for all children to his theological background. He graduated from Union Theological Seminary and credits his advisor and supervisor in urban ministry as having shaped his understanding of the public engagement of the church. Hornbeck was also impacted by another formidable urban religious leader, the African-American priest, Father Paul Washington, known for his courageous moral leadership in the political struggles in Philadelphia. Both of these uh, clergy people influenced Hornbeck's understanding of the role of public theologians in working for the common good and expanded his perspective on vocation. He didn't go into ordained ministry, but he went into education reform, um, and, but his sense of vocation is no less grounded in his theological commitments. Although Hornbeck's critics would say he failed to move the state toward just distribution of resources for city schools, the cause for a fair funding formula has been picked up by a faith-based organization called POWER, Pennsylvanians Organized to Witness, Empower, and Reform. This growing coalition of ordinary churches and synagogues has taken on one of the most complex policy issues before the public, yet one which is critical to the quality of life for thousands of urban school children. This is power. They have organized across the state and regularly lobby state legislators, write local newspapers, educate the public about the issue. In order to meaningfully um, enter into the public discourse with credibility and confidence, power has done their homework. They've generated statistical analyses on the in inequity of public funding for education away from poor urban districts. Oops. <coughs> so this is... Um, this is part of the statistical analysis that they have uh, generated. I'm not gonna unpack the whole thing, but basically they can show the state, these are school districts, uh, the brown ones that um, are more racially diverse and have a uh, larger uh, degree of, uh, this is poverty and this is how much the state is spending per child, and you can see that the white school districts across the board are getting more than the school districts, um, uh, which are largely minority. Power has learned the language of educational policy and the complex geography of political power. They have, as public theologians, ordinary congregations become bilingual with this issue. Public education in American cities is indeed in crisis, and we are in danger of losing another generation to diminished opportunities for economic success and quality of life. In other words, assigning them to poverty. Public theologians have largely ceded responsibility for education policy to the experts, a distorted expression of faith in leaders who are failing our children. 
through efforts by people such as David Hornbeck and organizations like Power, public theology is beginning to enter the discourse on education reform. We cannot imagine the common good apart from quality education for all. Thank you. Thank you for all your detailed view in the world of problems that you have unfolded before us. I think there's a lot to think about and perhaps also to ask. Yes. So I, I would just complicate um, part of this. Um, this is his field, by the way. This is Helene's <laughs> field. He knows much more. <laughs> so there's actually uh, sociological education data to suggest that one of the reasons that the church has got out of it, uh, the public school is because they're fighting amongst each other for control between the denominations. Okay. So when the Catholic, when the public supported Catholic schools were losing ground to the Baptist supported and the Quaker supported, rather than cede it to each other, they said, well, then we'll all get out. And they issued policy so that none of them could engage anymore. So it was infighting within the Christian churches themselves which led to the decline of the ability to engage in the schools. Mm. And I think that that is part of the historical reason why it's been so hard for us to speak back into that condition. Mm -hmm. Because we have documentation that says we're the ones who said we should get out in the first place. Mm -hmm. But we did it for the wrong reasons. We did it because the other people were about to get more influence than us. Which makes it worse, I think. Actually, <laughs> makes your point that, even better. That is way back. I mean, that's that's yeah. pretty far, far back. Um, and as uh, pretty early on, they were advocating for some kind of universal and publicly funded from John Adams <clears> on. So there was that infighting. If you know anything about American history, they started. They did not start off uh, as. Um, separation of church and state. Um, there were, the colonies were, were uh, had very definite uh, religious affiliations. So example, Virginia was very Anglican. Um, but it, as the uh, uh, Constitution got written, then they decided that the best thing was to completely separate uh, the country, separate church and state for the good of both the church and of the state, that they could be mutually corruptive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bad. <laughs> Thank you, first of all, for this clear analysis of the situation. And I've understood there, is a, there are many reasons to engage in, in order to ameliorate public education. And I've heard about it, the declining capacity to do so. But what I'm interested in is the question uh, with which strategy theologian could engage in the field of public education. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned the linguality. Mm -hmm. Should they argue as citizens? Mm -hmm. Or is it allowed to argue as a theologian mm -hmm. with a certain, let's say, worldview horizon? Well, I think there are many ways, and uh, as citizens, but also I tried to give two examples of an individual who became a reformer. Mm -hmm. I mean, did not go into the academy finally or ordained ministry, but in so to try, I'm trying to introduce people to other vocations of reform, but also a collective um, uh, public theology statement in the advocacy and what this uh, uh, coalition of churches and synagogues has accomplished is really extraordinary and it, it's a very complicated issue when you get to the state issue level and they have uh, generated research, they have educated themselves, they have learned to speak the language of ed education policy. So, and I also think that um, denominations, now denominations are certainly declining in their 
impact in our society. So if the Presbyterian Church issues, this is our policy statement on public education, there might be a big yawn in Congress. Um, but uh, that's not to say that, that uh, faith groups cannot uh, lobby, cannot speak out, cannot get involved. So, but just issuing statements anymore is not effective. Yeah, those days are over. Um, just uh, maybe if I may ask two questions. One is the, I mean, you talk about this uh, public education, schools, and so on. But it seems to me that uh, in the States, the funding for the colleges and the Christian universities it seems to me, it is, from an outside point of view, is quite well funded. And, uh, quite, uh, um, so I, I just wanted to ask you whether uh, many of the Christian denominations are focusing on their education efforts to the colleges and the universities instead of the uh, that's schools. A I don't know. I, that's that's a, another whole issue, um, and that is we have private and public colleges and universities. The private universities, let me see if I have this, that the private universities, um, Okay, black students. This is at colleges. Um, the, uh, you can see, this is, if you can see here, uh, these are the deciles of earning, alumni, what alumni earn, right? So 10, the 10th uh, decile would be um, the highest earning alumni. And they have the lowest number of black students. Now, private colleges depend on their alumni for giving, right? So what happens is that black students end up going here in the less well-funded colleges. So even if they do get in, into college, um, the colleges they get into are often less well-funded than these other colleges. So. Up here, for, there are a whole network of historically black colleges. Um, do you know how many HBCs there are? Historically? Historically black, there's a network of historic black uh, universities and colleges at Spelman you might have heard of, or some of these. And putting them all together, they have less income than Harvard. So. So there's inequity even in the secondary education. So again, it replicates itself. So if you're going to a less well-funded college, you're going to have less prestige, less perhaps a lower education level. Even with a college degree, you're, it's not a level playing field. Yes, I, I have um, three questions, but um, they belong to each other. Um, this gap of quality education for big groups of the population. Um, you um, advocated a bit for a political advocacy. Um, that was the question, uh, must the advocacy be more um, with a citizenship um, um, background or more with a Christian background? Um, that is not so very clear for me. Then a uh, second form to act as churches could be to, um, to found private Christian schools, especially in those quarters um, where um, those um, students live um, who need support, to find ways how you can make high quality education with, with not so much money, possibly. That, is that a possibility that is discussed so, and realized? I'm sorry. And, and the second, uh, third part of the question, um, is it discussed in, in Philadelphia um, that um, there may be a correlation between quality education and democratic culture? 
Um, yes, <laughs> as in as in the Democratic Party, that cult, or Democratic like participation. Okay. Democratic culture as um, as a, a form of culture that needs um, well-educated citizens for making them able to find um, decisions that they can um, 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 take um, responsible. Right. <laughs> These are all great questions. Um, uh, political advocacy obviously uh, can be can come from any corner of society that notices and cares. I'm speaking to public theologians because we should be the first people on this issue because this is about structural racism. This is about it, um, uh, the the institutionalization of poverty. I mean, this is really a crisis, and we should be on the forefront, and we're not. So, so it's not just a Christian advocacy issue. It can be anybody. Um, when you talk about parochial schools, so in our cities, um, the, uh, particularly the Catholic Church has had uh, some, uh, many, uh, parochial schools, which are much less expensive than private schools, um, but they do cost something. But they have smaller classroom size. They have, they have religious education. They are attracting um, non-Catholic African American uh, uh, families who are desperate to get out of the Philadelphia public school system. Now. Catholic social teaching is great on poverty, but they are not big advocates of making the public schools better because they're benefiting. So um, that, and that's a, uh, I'm not saying that uh, uh, just in a like kind of anti-Catholic rant, but uh, that's a, that is a, uh, criticism that they hear quite a bit. Um, and the third question was... The question was democratic oh, democratic culture, yes. Well, if you, I think um, that what you're seeing right now in our country um, with this wacky uh, campaign season and, and the irrationality about it, um, is uh, is reflective of our education. I mean, we are not educating and forming informed, critically thinking citizens. So, um, uh, so now they uh, uh, in our cities, um, our cities are overwhelmingly registered Democrat rather than registered Republican. But it's very, people are discouraged. They give up. They don't see enough change. And so they don't vote at very high rates. But that is, that is the question. How to, how to um, uh, strengthen our citizenry. I don't see immediately another question. I would like to uh, finish here because I have my paper done. Ah, yes, right. <laughs> but to thank you very much for this very challenging presentation and uh, your presence in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.